All right. I got two hands but one foot, so it takes a minute. <laughs> What's up? All right, so like uh, Pastor Adam said, my name's Mike. Um, if we haven't met, I would love to meet you. Thank you for coming to worship with us today, to hang out with us today. Um, I think the Jaguars are in town, so you took time out. Um, whatever. Um, but, but thank you. I do appreciate that. And Pastor Adam, I don't know where he went, but Pastor Adam, I just want to tell him thank you for giving me the opportunity to come up here and share what God's put on my heart as I prepare for this lesson today. And I truly appreciate him allowing me that opportunity. And speaking of uh, appreciation, does anybody know what October is? Pastor Appreciation Month, right? So I encourage you, yes, give it up for him. So I encourage you to, to go to them and just tell them thank you. Tell them, give them a handshake, a high five, a hug, whatever it is. Give them a card, a gift card. I saw Pastor Adam walking around with a Starbucks, so he must like Starbucks. Give them something just to show how much that you do appreciate them because we do appreciate everything they do. Pastor Adam, Pastor Joey, Pastor Corey, we appreciate all that they do for us. I know, and Pastor Eric too, he'll be here second service, but our founding pastor, I know if it wasn't for them in my life, I wouldn't be where I am today, uh, sewing into me. So I truly appreciate everything that you guys do for us. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. And how important is it to have the right person in the right spot, right? The right leader in the right spot. We see in the book of Nehemiah here where we're getting ready to go to, the end of it, we're gonna wrap up this series in Nehemiah 13. We can see what happens when you have the wrong leader in place and you'll see what happens when the right leader's in place and that right leader comes back to take care of some stuff, amen? So Father God, we give you all the glory, we give you all the praise. I thank you for everything that you're doing inside of these walls and outside of these walls and all the giving that's going on, Father God. I thank you that this is a church that gives back, Father God, that doesn't stay inside these four walls. We give you all the glory. I pray that I become small and you come very, very big, Father God. I clear the stage of everything and give it all to you and what you have to say, Father God. I pray your words are heard. As we talk about these topics today, I pray that you soften the heart of people, that they hear what you truly are having to say, that they hear your heart behind the message, Father God. And we give you all the glory. I pray that whoever's in here that may not even know you yet, Father, that they would come to know you, Father, that they would come to have a life-saving moment, Father God, that eternal salvation moment, Father God. We give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So like I said, we're going to wrap up the Supernatural Building Series and we're going to talk about Nehemiah 13. But before we get into Nehemiah 13, I want to look at Nehemiah 12. And I want to look at one verse that's in there that's going to help us set the stage on where we're at, what happened, and how we got to what happens in Nehemiah 13, all right? So Nehemiah 12, verse 44. It says, on that day. That day is the dedication of the wall. That day... Nehemiah is overseeing these activities that are going on, right? He's overseeing the, the dedication of the wall, the procedures for the temple, people getting put into place. It goes on to say, men were also appointed over the chambers for the supplies, the contributions, the first fruits, and the tithes to gather into them from the fields of the cities the portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites. So you see... We see people getting put into place here, right? People are getting put into place over these different chambers, right? And you're going to see what happens here now if you don't have the right person put into place or if maybe the leader's not the right person that's put there. So in verse 13, we see now prior, this is, or this is chapter 13, verse 4. Now prior to this, Eliashib, the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God. So he's appointed over all of it. Remember how I just said in 1244, there were certain men put in these different areas, right? Eliashib's the high priest over top of all of it, right? The man in charge there, right? So being related to Tobiah, we've heard this name before, 
have prepared a large room for him where previously they used to put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil prescribed for the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priest. That's a lot there, right? So you see the man in charge, Eliashim, right? Give away, <laughs> give away part of the storeroom, right? The places that they're supposed to be keeping, the ties, the offerings, the frame, all these things. He's giving away a room to Tobiah. Who Tobiah, right? He was the one that came against Nehemiah previously already. We saw that, right? He came against Nehemiah previously on building the wall. He didn't want the wall to build. So technically, you've got somebody going against God, an enemy of God, now living inside of these storerooms where the tithes and the offerings are supposed to be at. But the question has to be, why was there room to begin with, right? A few chapters ago, the people said that they were going to bring in all their tithes. They were going to start doing that. They weren't going to forsake the kingdom. So these places should be full, right? Well, obviously they stopped. They stopped bringing in their tithes. They stopped bringing in all their offerings. They stopped bringing in their materials that they have because there's a room available for them. So the question is, why did they stop? Why did they stop giving away their stuff, right? Why did they start to forsake the house of God? Well, you find that in the very next verse. Verse 6. But during all this time, I was not in Jerusalem. When the cat's away, the mice will play. You ever heard that saying, right? When the cat's away, the mice will play. So who wasn't in Jerusalem at this time? Nehemiah. Nehemiah's gone at this time, right? So people were put into charge. Nehemiah, who had set stuff in place, is now gone. Why did he leave? Why did he have to go away? Well, in chapter 2 of Nehemiah, he's talking to the king, and the king's asking him, how long are you going to be gone? And Nehemiah tells him, I'm going to give you a definite time, right? I'm paraphrasing, but he's telling him, I'm going to give you a definite time. So it's like what we do with our kids. If you have kids, you give them a time, right? Like this is the time you're going to be back. So Nehemiah had a time limit on how long he could be gone, and he had to get back or else the king's going to start thinking something's wrong, something's happening, Nehemiah's not doing what he's saying, right? So he had to leave. He had to go back. And that's when things started to go awry. But here we go. The second part of verse 6, it says, After some time, however, I requested a leave of absence from the king, and I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Eliashib had committed for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courtyards of the house of God. It was very displeasing to me, so I threw all of Tobiah's household articles out of the room. Then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms, and I returned the utensils of the house of God there with the grain offering and the frankincense, right? This sounds familiar to some of us probably of another story we've heard about in the Bible. Let me read you something here. It sounds kind of the same thing that you find in Matthew 21. And Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all those who were selling and buying on the temple grounds. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. So you see, in Nehemiah and in Jesus' day, they both had to go in and cleanse the temple area, right? They had to cleanse the house of God because people had started to forsake the house of God. Right? They started to look at money, material things, as for themselves and not for the house of God. They started to look to see how they could benefit themselves and make more for themselves instead of how to further the kingdom and how to sow into the house. So last week, Adam talked about joy. Right? He talked about how we have joy rooted in us. We have to choose joy. We sh I think you said we shouldn't have the spirit of Eeyore right? Like we shouldn't be walking around with that spirit of Eeyore, which is true. We shouldn't be, right? But that, let's see how many people keep this joy that we have when I start talking about money today, <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. He gives me the hard topic to talk about. He gets joy, <laughs> right? But there's joy in everything. Can I tell you that? And there's so much more that we're going to talk about than just money. So 
What is this tithe? What is this offering that we hear about that's getting restored? Right? Is it dealing with only money? Is this something that we have to do today? Right? Do we tithe today? Do we give today? Don't worry, Adam. We'll be okay. Right? Is this something that we do? Right? What do we give to the church? What is it that we're going to talk? So let's see. The new, uh, in the Old Testament, the tithe, right, just the beginning of it was a mere 10%. That was just the start of it, right? If you looked at all their giving and what they give and what it totaled, it ranged almost all the way up to 25 to 30%, right, is where they got to. Far more than that 10%. The word tithe in Hebrew literally means 10%, right? But they gave way more than that. In the New Testament, you don't see the word tithe, right? You see it one time, really, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he's basically telling them, congratulations, you're tithing on your mint and your cumin and your dill, which were herbs that you don't even need to tithe on. They were going above and beyond, but they had forsaken so much more. They've forsaken the justice, the faithfulness, and everything else. Now, Jesus doesn't tell them not to tithe. He says, you should have been doing these other things without forsaking the tithe. Amen? That's what they missed out on. So, the New Testament does tell us to give. You literally said this just from the stage and I laughed. Acts 20, 35. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Right? And then in uh, Galatians 6.10, it says, So then while we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. So just above in Acts, what we talked about where he says that it's much, it's, um, you're more blessed to give than to receive. Just above that, it's like two verses in verse 33. Paul states that I didn't covet, covet any of your money, which means he didn't desire any of their money. He didn't lust after their money. He didn't come to them for that reason. He came to share the gospel, to spread the gospel, to see a heart change, a life change, right? Now, don't get me wrong. They gave to Paul. They gave to his ministries, right? What he's saying is, I didn't come for that. I didn't covet that. Journey doesn't even have a standard offering message that's here, right? You don't see the buckets being passed. They're on the sides, I think, right? There's ways to give, but it's not coveting. We're not desiring to come after your money, right? It's a heart change, Right? We don't want to guilt somebody into something, just like you don't want to guilt somebody into salvation. Right? It's a heart change. It's why do we give? How do we get this opportunity to? That's what it's about. And in Galatians 6, 6.6, 6, it says, The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So when it comes to all good things that we're called to share, some of us who have ample means, right, it can be harder for us to give of our time. It can be harder for us to give of our talents than it is to write a bunch of zeros on a check, right? Some of us can do that all day long, but it's the time, it's the talents that we have a trouble doing. If you look at Matthew 19, you're not gonna see him up there, but if you look at Matthew 19, you see the story of the rich man. And he's coming to Jesus and he's saying, how can I be good, right? Jesus is telling him, right, don't commit murder, don't commit adultery. Right? Don't lie. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he's like, I'm doing all of that. And Jesus is like, if you truly want to be complete, go sell all your possessions, give to the poor, and follow me. And it grieved him. Right? And he turned around and walked away because he couldn't do it. Right? I'm not telling you to go sell all your possessions right now and give to the poor. That's not what I'm saying. But when you understand that nothing you have is yours... And that everything you have belongs to him, that's what it's about, amen? That's what it's about, giving into the kingdom. However, for those that have little wealth, giving just a little bit could be more than what they could do, right? In Mark 12, Jesus is sitting opposite the treasure, right, where they bring in their money, right, where they bring in their contributions. He sees all these rich people bringing in all this money, and then this elderly lady <laughs> drops two coins in, right? And he says, truly, she's given so much more, right? And they don't understand what he's saying, but what he's telling them, right? And he says, all of them gave out a surplus. She gave everything she had for me, 
right? She gave everything she had, which is exactly what he was telling the rich man to do. She got it, right? She got it. She wasn't giving out of her surplus. So giving to the church, though, is about so much more than money. So much more. I would evaluate one's giving by three things, times, talent, and treasures, right? Which could equal a tithe in the Old Testament, right? A tithe wasn't just money in the Old Testament. Today, a tithe isn't just tithing on your money. It's your time, your talent, your treasure. And time, the first thing I want to talk about, I would argue it's probably the most important one, right? It's our greatest resource, you only have a certain amount of time. I can remember last year, my daughter's in band and Fleming Island had a song that said like 525,600 minutes was in their song, right? Which is how many minutes are in a year, right? And it says, how are you gonna, you know, what are you gonna do with that? How are you gonna spend that? You can't get any of it back, right? How are you gonna choose to spend it? On natural things, right, in the world or on heavenly things? We're called to chase after heavenly rewards. Don't store up our treasures on earth where it can rot, right? So if that's the case and there's 24 hours in a day, 2.4 hours a day, you should be sowing into the kingdom. That's a gut check when I think about it, right? 2.4 hours a day, you should be sowing into the kingdom, right? I'm not saying up here at the church, 2.4 hours a day, sowing into the kingdom, but somehow, some way, digging in, right? The New Testament urges every Christian to care for fellow Christians, for fellow church members in ways that require us to give generously of our time. In Romans, Paul states, we are called to weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, right? Or I could have flipped it, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, but you get the point. If we're called to celebrate victories, if we're called to be with those that fall into sin, that are hurting, how are we gonna do that if we're too busy? If we're in a hurry all the time, right? (laughs) I tell people, don't ask somebody in the hallway how they're doing if you're not willing to take the time when they say, I'm not doing good. And then you're going, I shouldn't have asked that question. (laughs) Right, I got somewhere to go, Adam needs me, I gotta be on stage, whatever the case may be. Don't ask the question, tell them good morning, Carry on and do what you got to do, right? Pastor Adam said we shouldn't have a spirit of Eeyore, which I totally agree. We shouldn't have a spirit of Eeyore. We should be going around poor, poor me, right? But sometimes we have to be real with other people, right? Which I know that's what he was talking about too. You got to be real. You got to stop and say, hey, this is what's going on. And it might be you saying, how's your day going? Everything okay? And them saying, no, I really need to talk to you, right? Take the time to talk, right? Consider what Paul's address says to the Christians here in Galatians. It says, brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual are to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you are not tempted as well. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Restoring somebody that's fallen into sin, restoring somebody that's hurting takes time. And it's not just the pastor's time right? They can't do all of it. That's called for all church members to do. We're all called to do that, right? There's also a warning in there to watch out when you're doing it, right? Sometimes you can't spend all your time on one person that may not get it. That's just not getting it, right? And then you're going to miss out on everybody else that's coming to you, right? Or you're going to miss out on your family, whatever the case may be that's taking a precedence, right? So you got to watch yourself. He's giving you that warning as well. It's work for the whole body, right? And our calling from God to be church members is just one of many callings that we have, right? Um, When we're talking about times, talents, and treasures, some of us are called to take care of kids. Some of us are called to uh, study, be teachers, whatever the calling should be. But the one thing about our callings and when we're talking about time, talents, and treasures is you should not, right, We should never use faithfulness in one area to excuse us from not doing it in any other area, right? Here's what I mean by that. It's the same thing as in Matthew 23. Matthew 23, 23 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law. Justice and mercy and faithfulness, but these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. So right there he's telling, he's not saying don't tithe. He's saying you should have done all the rest without neglecting the tithe as well. Don't neglect any of them. Amen. So if we don't have our time, are we too busy to weep with those who weep? We need to relax. We need to stop. Right? We need to recharge. If our kids' sports games or band competitions <laughs> cost so much time, right? Sometimes we need to stop and breathe and take a break, right? Um, what if Nehemiah hadn't stopped and listened to what God was saying about building the wall, right? Sometimes we just need to stop. And if we're in a hurry, we need to take a Sabbath. If you're not practicing taking a Sabbath, right? That's the other thing in Nehemiah 13. They restore the Sabbath as well, right? We need to recharge, right? You need to stay focused on the Lord. And if we're too busy, and you can be too busy doing church stuff, right? You need to stop, recharge, focus, right? Focus back on the Lord. Spend time with him. So the second one is our talents. So we see in 1 Corinthians, one of the glories of the body of Christ is that the diversity of gifts the Spirit has given us. And it's not the gifts that we're going to go into next series. These are the gifts of the Spirit here. To build up the body, though. Now, not every Christian possesses every gift, right? But every Christian has a gift or two, whatever the case may be. And that's given, the Spirit has given that to build up the church. It's not for your own personal stuff. It's to build up the church. So what do spiritual gifts have to do with the talents that I just talked about, right? Well, not every talent is a spiritual gift, but many spiritual gifts are rooted in all of our talents. All right? So do you have a knack of getting things done the right way, always the right way, you know, nice, neat? Maybe it's administrative, right? Do you have a history of having a servant heart? I know my son has a very servant heart after trying to get, you know, help everybody out. Maybe you have a helping, right? Maybe your gift is helping. Whatever it is, whatever that gift is, God has arranged the body of Christ so that every member helps each other out, right? We can't operate without the other. The body of Christ needs every single gift, right, that the Spirit gives to grow. What does that mean, right? Nobody's better than the other. I'm no better sitting up here being able to share the word today then Don and Beth sitting at guest services, then those at the door welcoming, then those outside that welcome to the coffee. I'm definitely not better than the kids' church. Pray for them, right? <laughs> definitely not better than any of them back there that's sowing into the next generation. We're just one generation away, right? Sowing into that. I know people that have been back there for years sowing in to that next generation. They see my kids grow and grow and grow, right? So nobody's, we all have the same calling on our life to spread the gospel, to share the word. And anybody in here can lead someone to Christ. He uses every one of us in this area, right? Myself sharing the message to you out here, to wherever you may be, to maybe lead someone to Christ today. Amen. And if you're in here and you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't have a relationship with him. You have a gift that is needed in the body of Christ. You've come to the right place. So, yes. And as you're sitting there searching your talents, wondering what talent do I have, whatever gift it is that you have, we should always remember it's not for you. It's to build up the church. Right? So, the last one that we're going to talk about here, treasures. Treasures. Money. Right? The fun one. Whatever earthly treasures God has given us, he wants us to invest them into eternity, right? He wants us to invest those into eternity. One of the main ways we can invest the wealth into eternity by investing in the body of Christ. Galatians 6.6, 6, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. This is saying that if you have a home church, maybe this isn't your home church, right? If you have a home church, you're being taught regularly, you're being so, or getting sewn into, right? Like you're being taught there, you're called to give all good things to those who teach. You should be sewing into that home church. 
Throughout the New Testament, we see that Christians are characterized by giving generously. I told you, it's not about the tithe. It's about giving generously to provide for one another's needs. That's what we're doing with the baskets, right? That's what we did uh, with the water bottles that we sent down, right? We did, that's what we're doing is providing for others' needs. Acts 2, verse 44 and 45. They don't have it. I'm sorry. I added this last minute. And all the believers were together and had all things in common, and they would sell their property and possessions, right, and share them with all to the extent that anyone had need. Acts 4. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. That's what I'm telling you about, right? That's what I'm talking about. I'm not telling you to go sell all your possessions. I'm telling you, when you realize that nothing belongs to you, you're able to give it away to whoever needs it, whenever they need it, right? But all things were common property to them. So one of the main outlets for our giving should be supporting our home church. That should not be where it stops. It should not be that you just write a 10% check, you tie, then that's where it stops, right? Giving earthly treasures involves far more than merely writing a check. Whatever possessions we think we own, right, are given to us by God for us to steward for others' good and his glory. So whatever possessions God entrusted you with, how can you use them to serve others? Think about that. How can you use what God's given you, right? Could you give away a car to somebody or let someone borrow a car? I know when I had my motorcycle, I had a motorcycle, a car, and then Rach had her car as well, right? I used to ride the motorcycle all the time, so I didn't need my car. I would give my car to someone to drive for weeks, months. I'd still pay for it. I still had all the stuff, right? But just because it wasn't mine, right? It was God's, and someone needed it more than I do. What if you went away for a summer? Could you give your house to a mission? missionaries to stay in it. I don't know where you're going for the summer. Can I come with you? But could you give your house away to let them stay there, right? Or another room that you have. Whatever it is, God has given us all some measure of time, talents, and treasures. And he wants us to turn a spiritual profit on all of it, right? On every single bit of it. Matthew 25 is a parable of the talents. The first two doubled their talents, right? The third one buried his talent, trying to protect the talent, basically keeping it for himself, right? He, he has told us to invest in the body. That's to include our finances as well. One thing in the parable teaches us is that we will be held accountable with how we steward the master's resources, right? Did we waste the opportunities that were given to us? It's not so much what did you do with it, It's did you waste the opportunity that was given to you to steward those resources? You see, some will come to you and preach a prosperity gospel, right? Oh, you put in a hundred bucks, you're going to give a thousand back. The word does say, right, you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You sow uh, abundantly, you reap abundantly, right? That's the blessings that you're going to reap. It's not talking about put in a hundred, get a thousand back, right? That's not what we're talking about. I've noticed in my life... And I've heard from countless others, when you put the practice of tithing into place, of giving to the church in that practice, see what God does, right? In Malachi, he says, test me in this, right? He says, test me in the tithe, which was more than monetary that was being tested, right? It's more than money, which today it's more than money, it's time, talents, it's treasure. But he says, test me in this. See what happens, right? It's the only time you hear that, so I would argue, test him in that. See what happens, When I was having the problems of tithing and stuff like that, you could see the difficulties that happened. But when you put it into place, every need was met, right? Whatever the case may be, you get a random check in the mail. Someone comes over to your house that takes care of something that you would have had to spend thousands of dollars on. Or someone gives you something that you needed that would have cost you more money than what you needed, right? Things just started to happen and you're like, how does this happen? That somehow is God. Right? God provides for all your needs that you have. So this all boils down to a heart issue, right? Which is funny because in our journey Bible class that we talk about 
For two and a half years, we've been talking, it's a heart thing. It all boils down to a heart thing. So I'll ask you, or tell you kind of, <laughs> not in a mean way. So we, we have taxes that we have to give in America, right? Because it's the law. It's the law to give these taxes, unfortunately. Then we have bills we have to pay, right? Cell phone bills, electricity bills, heating bills, whatever the, not in Florida heating, AC bills, whatever bills you have that you have to pay, right? Because you're going to lose it if you don't. Then we have like golfing and fishing and uh, guns, people like to go shoot or sewing machines or whatever it is that people like to go do and spend time with. On their kids, they spend money, right? Because we love it. We want to do that. It brings joy to us. That's what we enjoy to do, right? So why are you giving of your time, talents, and treasures, right, your money, why are you doing it? Do you think it's the law? Jesus fulfilled the law. He didn't abolish the law, right? He fulfilled the law. Are you doing it because you're afraid you're going to lose your salvation? Right? It's a work-based theology that you got to do. Or do you truly enjoy it? Right? That's what Paul's talking about when he wants us to give generously. Right? Give with a cheerful heart. That's what he's talking about there. Right? Because we want to do it because we understand what the giving is about. So if you're sitting there right now and you're going, see, I told you I didn't have to give 10%. You've missed the message. You missed it completely, right? That is not what I'm saying at all, right? It's so much more than that. When Jesus talked about commandments in the, uh, in the Old Testament or laws, he took that thing to another level, right? What did he say when he talked about murder? If you have anger in your heart, you've committed murder. What did he say when about the adultery? He says if you lust after a woman, you committed adultery. He took it to the next level. I don't think he took tithing down a level, right? He literally told them you should not have forsaken that, right? 10% is barely the minimum of what your giving should be. Amen? So I would argue 10% that we give to our local church to help spread the gospel, which is what we're called to do in Matthew 28, is just merely a starting point for us in our giving of our time, talents, and treasures. So, we're ending this supernatural building series where Nehemiah is calling the people back to a heart of worship, right? He's calling them back to a heart of worship towards God. Because they had a heart of worship, it was just towards the wrong thing, right? He did that by restoring the tithe. He did that by restoring the Sabbath, right? Restoring their hearts to a heart of of worship. You see, they had just a few chapters earlier said they're never going to forsake the kingdom of God, right? They're not, they're not going to do that. They're not going to forsake the house of God. And just merely a year or so after Nehemiah left, within that year, they had started to forsake the house of God, right? So this is how I want to end service today. If you want to rise to your feet with me, the worship band can come up here. I'm going to have part of the band come up. Did that go dead? Is that good? Sorry. I'm going to have the band come up here, and they're going to play a song. And that song is Heart of Worship, right? And it's, it's I'm coming back to you, Lord, right? Uh, I'm coming back to you. That's what we're talking about here. That song is called Heart of Worship, and I want us to get...